key thing, I think. Uh, so this morning, uh, thanks everybody for being here today uh, in person and on the web. We have a couple of really cool and interesting uh, talks. I heard that, or just read an article the other day that said that you know 20% or 25% of us are morning people, uh, and 25% are night owls, 50% are kind of in between. So for those of you that are morning people, I have no idea who you are. I don't understand you at all, but thank you for being here uh, for the night owls. Uh, so we have uh, four talks. We're going to have a series of three talks, a small break, and then another talk. Uh, that's going to focus on policy changes, both at the, the macro level and then individual experiences with uh, paradigm shifts. And so our first talk is going to be Professor Mark Hayward, and he's going to be discussing institutional policy changes and growing inequality in the U.S. health and mortality. So I hope my talk doesn't move us backwards. Let me see here. This is the just to make sure I'm going forward, yeah. push the, the, okay, the palm tree. So um, I'm going to talk to you about a paradigm shift in my own work. I'm going to talk to you about a paradigm shift in how we think about a problem. Um, if you personally, if you were to look at my CV, you would think, and you would be right, that I look at developmental origins of disease. And I've looked at the developmental origins of disease for a long time. What I'm going to talk to you about today is not about the developmental origins of disease. It's actually a problem that we got started on by um, accident, which is where a lot of science is done. And in fact, the accident has now led to a new five-year NIH grant, which we're deeply appreciative of. So I'm engaged in this kind of new endeavor, which is to look at, is bringing institutions back into the conversation about how we understand trends and inequalities in American health and mortality. It's a new thing because a lot of times we focus on more agentic explanations, human agency, more epiphenomenal explanations. What's behind the rise in mortality? We turn to a lot of public health silver bullets. I'm going to stay away from those public health silver bullets. That doesn't work. That works. So this is, this is totally a collaborative uh, endeavor. You see my colleagues up here. Um, Jennifer Karis Montez is a as a, a, a young junior scholar from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health and Society Scholars Program, which Christy is also a graduate of. Um, we, she's the team leader of this project. I wanted to point out Stephen Wolf. Some of you may know Stephen from the National Academy of Medicine. Stephen was the study director for those two National Research Council volumes on why American mortality sucks. That's a clinical term. Um, but has been lagging increasingly behind other high-income countries and is, I will tell you, I have new estimates, it's continuing to lag and in fact it's getting worse. So here are my key points. Let's figure out what the key facts are that we're trying to explain. You think that we, you know, demographers, we're simple-minded people, we don't deal with a lot of variables at one time. But, um, but we've had trouble getting the facts straight and so there's been actually arguments in the field. I'm not actually going to introduce some ideas to you, I'm not going to be complete. I'm just going to sample some ideas so that you can see what were kinds of issues that we're grappling with and that you may want to be extending to your own work. And then I'm going to talk to you about what we think of as the emergence of multiple Americas and the involvement of, of US states institutional policy changes that are driving a lot of what we're seeing at the national level. So you'd think that this little um, relationship between um, US, uh, between education, which is the marker that we're using for inequality and US adult health and mortality would be simple. And um, to some extent, it has been thought about that way. The usual way that we think about education's influence over health and mortality is very much an agentic way. You have access, educated people provides access to information and support for healthy lifestyles. It gives you access to good jobs. It gives you valuable relationships. It provides sophisticated cognitive skills greater sense of human agency, that kind of thing, control over your life, right? It's very agentic. By that I mean it's really about us making decisions and behavior. Now, you've heard, you've probably seen the New York Times, I don't know, JAMA, wherever you want to look. I will tell you these are the best estimates that we have. These are from my team. I think they're the actual most defensible estimates out there in the world that we want to debate what actually is happening to life expectancy. And this is the life expectancy for white men and white women over the 1990-2010 period, 20 years. 
And what you'll see is in that low education group, zero to 11, most of them, you know, high school dropouts are not completing high school. That mortality has, uh, their life expectancies have gone down in an appreciable way. You see a pretty stagnant uh, uh, life expectancy trend for the high school. And for the people that no one cares about in the New York Times, which is the well-educated, we're cooking on all burners, all right? So the focus in the debate has always been about the low-educated people. We should care about them, but we shouldn't forget about the others because contrasting the what's going on within the well-educated and what's going on and the less educated provides us with clues about the different mechanisms that are at play because they're really quite different mechanisms as opposed to a variation on a mechanism. So I will come back to that. So just to make the point, just to look at the top slide, I'm not gonna, gonna go through this. It's a demographic decomposition. What you see is orange bars on zero to 11 for women, which are going all the way to the left. What that means is they're losing life expectancy at every age, which means over the 20 year period, mortality went up at every age, right? At every age. That is really important to get down. It is not one age that we're seeing mortality go up. It is all ages. Contrast college educated women, mortality is going down, life expectancy is going up. They're improving at all ages. Keep that in mind. Those are very different processes that are going on in, in the segmented parts of our population. I will say that those trends are continuing. I'm just, but I haven't published them. We're waiting for JAMA, you know. And we're a little nervous about this stuff. Anyway, so we, uh, we had to get theoretical. At, Demographers hate being theoretical. We like the facts. Facts are good. Theoretical, it's hard on us. But we nonetheless are straying on outside of fields that we are not usually playing in, one of which is political economy and political history and economic history. And we've turned to two noted economists, Richard Easterlin and Bob Fogel, and looking at these issues of the kind of institutional or national changes that are going on in technology. So as most of you have heard, you know, increases in technology displace people. And that's a kind of phenomenon that's going on out there. Fast technological change results in a lot of displacement. So you should keep that in mind. But we have the institutional capacity for health and we have things like the development of the Center for Disease Control that we've long forgotten about, but it was a very important institutional change. We have other national institutional changes that have been fundamental in terms of establishing this contract between Americans and their government and who they can trust which comes back to some of yesterday's conversation. One of the things that we haven't usually talked about is this issue of public and health policies, which is, and I'm really talking about here, political economy. We're gonna come back to this, the market for healthcare. I'm gonna focus heavily on issues like the federal devolution of power back to the states, who controls health policies such as tobacco control, like the states. We're gonna come back to the states time and time again. I think it has real implications for things like EPA and EPA's relationship with the states, which has a lot to do with yesterday's conversation. I'm not gonna talk about demography, which is what I know most about. I'm gonna talk about the things I know least about. So I'm gonna to talk to you about three major periods, and I just want you to think about these as three major periods. One is the technological innovation and the rise of the New Deal. This is where demographers actually were smart. We realized, well, what caused the rise in life expectancy in the American population over the first part of the 20th century? It's not rocket science. I will tell you, it's a lot of institutional changes that were filtered into the population as well as massive technological change. Then we had this great society and the culmination of the New Deal, and some of you may not realize this. This is where inequality was low, and this is where health disparities were extremely low. So, fascinating. Then we have this other new period, which we probably have paid less, the least attention to, which is new federalism and the federal devolution of power back to the states. Federalism is a real issue here. So some technological and institutional changes promote improvements, some do not. In fact, some have the opposite effects. So here's the technological innovation and the rise of the New Deal. I won't go through all this, but lots of changes happen in technology. You can just pick out your favorites. Don't pick out DDT. Um, there, there was penicillin. There was a lot of vaccines that were involved. Water fluoridation was started. Center for Disease Control was started. You know, you had the great, you had uh, the New Deal, which is TVA, Social Security Act, minimum wage, shift to hospital deliveries. You name it, lots happened. Mortality began to go down in the United States. Inequality was low. 
especially across the states. Then we had the Great Society. I encourage you, if you're ever in Texas, and I know some of you may never want to go to Texas, but if you happen to find yourself lost in Texas, go to the, either Johnson Library in, in Austin on the University of Texas campus, or go to the Summer White House, which is one of the most compelling places you'll ever see. It is his ranch out in the hill country. It is absolutely gorgeous. But on the wall, one of my students said, how did you get inspired to think about these things? I said, I looked at the museum and the wall and what happened in the Great Society. If you look at what happened in the Great Society, basically we redefined every relationship that the federal government had with the American population. It was a phenomenal time. And I will say, just as a little quip, we're trying to undo everything that was done then. So along came um, this period. I'm just going to say 1971 to 1980. You can look at some of the things that I've done in bold, but I'm really going to start focusing on new federalism, which is the shift in the power for some federal programs at the time uh, back to the states. And guess what? State life expectancies began to trickle apart. It's quite interesting at that time. Causality. We, we can come back to causality issues. In 1980s, um, we really saw this issue of federal devolution um, kind of hit full stride. And one of the things that you may not realize is that while you give power back to the states, a lot of times you don't give real strong guidelines, and you don't give any resources, and you don't give any um, uh, markers for accountability, which is a very problematic issue. So it leaves states on their own to do what they will. I don't know about your state legislature, but I know about the Texas state legislature. I know what goes on in the Texas state legislature. If you want to know where politics are really done and where, they're, where you're able to be influenced by outside forces, state legislatures are a really good case study. <clears throat> so in 1990s, we saw this Welfare Reform Act, which was really the kind of major centerpiece for this uh, kind of federal devolution. We also saw state EITCs, or income, earned income tax credits, going, which exacerbated the inequality because earned income tax credit program is a really effective anti-poverty program. Some states have it, some states don't. <clears throat> states varied when they introduced it. States vary in terms of their generosity. So the other thing that happened was, guess what, EPA, I actually have a little bit of about environment here. They actually started thinking about this relationship between EPA and the states, and they have this program, <clears throat> NEEPS. Some of you may know NEEPS a lot better than I do, and if you're from the state or if you're from the feds, you probably have a NEEPS relationship. But here, states, it was realized that states weren't devoting enough resources to implement federal requirements. People realized states lacked political will. States and feds engaged in constant sniping. Not a surprise, it's been going on. I'm sure my state was in the lead. And there was really not much information to help address problems with partnerships. Who talked about trust yesterday? <clears throat> well, this is a real area for trust that I think is going to be <clears throat> really important because ultimately you're going to have an institutional uh, conduit through which a lot of this stuff is going to flow, I suspect. <clears throat> anyway, let me give you a sense. Here's this idea that we chase epiphenomenal risk factors. We do well on getting rid of one risk factor, another risk factor arises. We're in this constant chasing our tail circle. So um, this is an old paper by McKinley and Marceau, which is really nice because it says, you know, we ought to pay attention. I know we do public health or population health, but we ought to pay attention to the kind of upstream factors that are going on that are kind of driving these epiphenomenal uh, characteristics in the population. <clears throat> One of my colleagues wrote this AJPH editorial <clears throat> where we're talking about three institutional policies that we're paying close attention to with respect to growing state inequality and mortality, which is deregulation, devolution, and this new phenomenon called preemption, which I will come back to in a few minutes. So let me give you a, a quick tour of state differences. <clears throat> this is Europe. These are states. See how um, the, far, the Eastern European bloc generally has a really, really horrible life expectancy. Just say, orange is bad. You can't see the le legend. Green is good. The greener it is, the better it is, OK? When green, that's, like, that's a good analogy. So um, here's the United States, just to give you a sense. This is life expectancy in 2010. This is the contrast between American states 
and European countries. Just to give you a sense of where are we on this level, you know, how do we have this conversation? You know, when you want to put this in perspective, <clears throat> and where are we, what's dragging down American um, life expectancy statistics? Well, there's a lot of state variation here. Um, just, I won't, I won't belabor this. But to give you a sense of the inequality in states, here's 1990, <clears throat> a 10-year period. Just to give you a sense, a 10-year period, 1990, we have, I just chose West Virginia, Mississippi, Oregon and Massachusetts, and, and this is life expectancy for women <coughs> at age 50. <clears throat> it's not a big difference in 1990 between these states, really roughly about uh, one and a half years, maybe a little less than that, which at age 50, not bad. Now look what happened in a 10-year period. <clears throat> now my point is, mostly, that inequality is rising, <clears throat> and it's rising fast. So. Now, at life expectancy at birth, between the highest state and the lowest state for women is 7.4 years. Just to put it in full context, 7.4 years separate women at birth, life expectancy in the best state and life expectancy in the worst state. Well, you know, the classic thing is they're just different people. Not, not really. We've got enough evidence. Let me just disabuse you of that idea. It's not about people. So um, let's talk about other things that states do to affect mortality. <clears throat> Here's what happened very recently in terms of state differences in cigarette excise taxes. And what you'll see is all of a sudden, boom, they happened, right? And I will tell you that we have a little sub-analysis. We just follow Minnesota <clears throat> and Mississippi, who diverge quite differently in their cigarette, state cigarette taxes. And there's a dose-response relationship between those cigarette taxes and smoking prevalence among the low educated. Among the well educated, you know what? We all look alike. Doesn't matter where we live. Here's state EITCs and their generosity. States vary. Variation has really exploded across states. This happened so fast. This is what we call state preemption. This is where the state capital says, no, Austin, you may not have stronger cigarette bans than the state has. You may not have more stringent nutrition requirements for your school lunch program. You must follow what the state says, right? And this is, a, this is very much a phenomenon. Look where the state preemptions are. This is actually color-coded for the kind of preemptions, and I won't, go, I won't go into that. So whose health is being affected by these state contexts? Do well-educated and poorly-educated people fare the same across states? I am not a morning person. <laughs> Grumpy, Mr. Grumpy. So um, d don't worry about the legends. What I did was I'm giving you graphs of six different health indicators. Some of them are like disability indicators, some of them are smoking, some of them are self-reported health indicators, you name it, right? If you look at the black line, which is the top, which defines the little ski slope here, what you'll see in the black line is it kind of is a ski slope, and it's people that are less educated, okay? I think in this case, it's less than high school, okay? The bottom line is the other line you should pay attention to. It's the college educated. And I will tell you in almost, and there is no case where the college educated differs significantly across states. We're all the same. I will tell you, any, any, any state gradient in inequality is driven by one group. It's driven by the group at the low end of the socioeconomic tail. It's always that case. But if you think you can't have an impact on the gradient, look at the right part of the graphs, because there is a lot of decline in a lot of those characteristics that we're talking, those health characteristics. We're doing the same for mortality. So we're, we're, we're moving along as fast as we can, given that we have to work in a data enclave. OK, I'm going to skip this. So um, here's the deal. We need to put this issue about inequality, in this case I'm talking about education and health relationships, in the context. What we're talking about is a relationship that is not in equilibrium. It is always changing. This is a new way to deal with life. 
life is not constant. It doesn't fit our nice little neat econometric models. As soon as you get done estimating something today, it's out of date tomorrow. Social determinants, in this case, what education is, is really social, its effect is really structured by the macro social and institutional environment. Those are the environments that sustain and create these relationships. This relationship, what does education do for me, is really endogenous in some ways to the larger context. Somewhat surprisingly to us, especially for those of us that are biodemographers that are now getting into areas of economics, political economy and political science, oh my God, this is like new territory for us, states are becoming institutional actors in sustaining this kind of inequality. And we would say it's critical to develop a stronger focus on the broader context of states and state policies as explanations for education and health and the generally social inequality in health and mortality in the US. I'm not gonna go through this, but I did put it in my slides so I have a record. Take a look at this YouTube video on Lake Providence, Louisiana. It's the most unequal place in America. It gives you an idea about what I'm talking about. The richest 5% earn $611,000 on average, 90 times what the bottom one-fifth make, just to put this in perspective. Yeah, there's a history of slavery and discrimination, don't get me wrong, but the point is social class has become the new driver, and it's legal, and it's persistent. So, I couldn't help myself. I know that Louisiana continually flunks enforcing air, water laws, EPA, so on and so forth. It's really this larger context behind which we're seeing, and this gets into the exposure arguments that so many of you have been interested in, because exposure here matters. And it also may matter in terms of how, the other social context may matter in terms of how those exposures ultimately are transmitted into disease risk. So what happens under the skin? And I would love, to, that's where I'm more comfortable talking to you about, but anyway, I thought I'd just throw this open as a teaser. This is the new grant that we have. Um, thank you, National Institute on Aging. Our focus is on the ways in which major institutional processes at the state level are shaping health and inequality in the US. We're looking at what's under the hood of American statistics, and we're really focusing on three institutional factors, which is deregulation, deregulation of a lot of things, right? A lot of things have been deregulated in all walks of life, everything that are absolutely inputs to American health. We've seen devolution, which has to do with powers that are states' rights, and we're pushing things back to the states on a continual basis. And lastly, states are even gaining more power within themselves in terms of enforcing homogeneity, not always to the highest level, which is through preemption. Some final thoughts. Um, there are a lot of Americas out there. If you think Texas is different, it probably is. But there are a lot of places that are different, and I think um, we ought to be paying attention to that. The differences in part of our policies, we have one group, us. As I said, we all look alike. We are cooking on all burners. What That original agentic model works for us. It doesn't matter where we are. Well-educated people, well-off, we're doing well. We can live in Mississippi, we can live in Montana. It really doesn't matter where we live in terms of our health. We are doing the same kinds of things. When a new study comes out, when the Surgeon General's report came, came out, guess what we all did across the country? We stopped smoking, or we didn't start smoking. And we were in tandem, and it didn't matter about quit lines, and it didn't matter Right? None of that mattered, but our well-educated matter in that process is quite different than for the other part of the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, life is not like an RCT. Occasionally we'll get lucky and we'll have a natural experiment. Thank you, Jesus. But um, it's rare because you know what the state legislature does in Texas? It only meets every two years. We live in fear when the legislature is in session. <laughs> Because they get a lot done, and what, what do I mean by a lot? Um, they, they screw up health care, they screw up education, they screw up the criminal justice system, they screw up, okay, my point is, they're deinvesting in a lot of things and they're bundled. You wanna say, how does that one thing affect 
whatever, that one thing has a multiplier effect and a ripple effect across multiple domains of life. Incarceration policies don't just affect the, affect the incarcerated, they affect the incarcerated's families too, right? So that's the problem with some of this work. It challenges us in terms of our traditional econometric perspectives on how to think about things. The other thing is evidence in a world that's not in equilibrium is tricky. We're constantly in a mode of kind of establishing what our evidence is in the evidentiary base. So change is the norm and not the exception. That is not how our econometric models work. I don't know how much you know about that, but we're assuming that the world is in equilibrium and it ain't. So um, let me just leave you with this one point. This is the next paper that we hope to get out, <coughs> which is U.S. life expectancy is continuing to stagnate. If you think we're going to fall further behind, we are. And it's really due to one process, and I won't show you the specific numbers because I still want to publish them. <clears throat> it's due to this bifurcation in life expectancy for the education groups. So I've gone over 300 slides <laughs> in 20 some minutes, and I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. If we have any questions for uh, Dr. Hayward. Yes. Thank you for a terrific uh, picture of what's going on. I work, in a, in a way, connected with this. I, I don't know that you've, I, uh, it, it's terrific, and I want to talk to you further about it. But. I'm wondering if there aren't other things there that are at least correlated with education. I think it does seem to me that environmental protections are better in the states that have uh, a better treatment of education and uh, the treatment of their citizenry, and that's another another. Oh, I agree. No, I'm, I mean, I'm just pointing out the highlights. I absolutely agree with you. Okay. No, there, there, we have no disagreement here. So I didn't think, we had, but if I you, wasn't sure we did, but I but want to I, make sure that was on the table. But if you want to think, and the reason I brought up Louisiana and the inequality was our well-educated ability to avoid the exposures. Oh, yes. Okay? Yes. yes. And we know about those exposures. Yes, we do. We are not going to live near those exposures, and we're not going to let those exposures come and live near us. But in so. certain states, we're happy to impose them on others. Correct. Wonderful. That is correct. And that's, that's the state variation in this exposure question that we touched on yesterday. And it may have other, it, I, I can't tell you, I mean, I, I'm, I usually look at exposure as a kind of, as a demographer, I'm really interested in this exposure issue. I've, I've, I've seen less in terms of how potential differential effects on body systems across in text. We, those are trickier to pick up anyway. So I have to have a data matrix that actually fills all cells. I don't always have that. What people don't realize when they're looking at these moderation processes is that if change is happening in a particular direction, you may not have a kind of dense information matrix in order to assess the kind of moderating influences you're looking at. I know that was just not making any sense whatsoever. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Would that I knew the Lautenberg bill. <coughs> yeah, microphone. It's as if I wasn't here yesterday. Um, but uh, the Lautenberg bill has a very specific provision to preempt states from doing any regulatory or even re risk review uh, work on chemicals that EPA has um, a plan to review within, I, I forget exactly what the time frames are. But uh, up until this, there was more of a patchwork of 
um, across the country of state activities around specific chemicals. Some legislatures were banning chemicals in products uh, that were of high concern to children, for example, and some of that now will theoretically go away because EPA is taking leadership and not allowing the states to act. I, I'm going to have, and that's my yeah. not very specific and precise interpretation of that, what I think the Lautenberg bill is telling the yeah, states. Yeah, I, th I will have to go back and actually look at that. But I would say the general principle is: is preemption forcing us to the lowest common denominator? And if that lowest common denominator is putting our populations at risk, then I think you have your answer. So, or you have my answer. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to spread this around a little bit. So, a quick note on that, the, yeah. the states that really fought the preemption were the best states, Minnesota, <clears throat> California, Massachusetts. And you know, wh and you know why. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's where states invest in their, this is the preemption issue, right? The preemption is to move to the lowest common denominator in some ways. It's it rarely, it's not impossible to have a highest level in terms of preemption, but we haven't seen it yet. So, over here. Yeah, I was interested in um, whether or not you've observed relationships between states that have some of the highest education levels and then the effect on the life expectancy of the population with the lowest expected or the lowest yes. education level within those states. Yes. So, I am. Oh well, doesn't matter. Here's. Um, I guess it's is I it will, a positive effect. I will tell you that the yes. So the inequalities. Our biggest are in the states which have the worst overall. How do I say this? So, um, the, the in it, I can't, I, my slides are gone. So, anyway, the <clears throat> in Massachusetts, let's just pick on Massachusetts or Minnesota, the inequalities are really low. The education levels for the states are really high. <clears throat> and in fact, let me just go back and see if I can, let me just show you. Can I go back? Okay, I'm just gonna. If you look in the right hand side of the graph, where you see the less educated doing well, relative, you know, there's a small gradient. Guess what? They're in the states where they're the most select. There are the least people that have less education. It's not. And what it means is this selection process where, you're, where, the, where the, those people that are getting increasingly fewer are more bereft, no. It is the opposite. In those places which have the biggest gradients, that's where you see education overall in a population being quite low. Those people with less education are not rare. They are not select, and they are in trouble. So the selection argument, this is what we use to counter this idea that increasingly the American population is more select over time. With respect to education, let me tell you, the effects of that low education group are coming from the least select groups in the United States. I'm wondering if you have thoughts about what the physiologic mediator of this education differential is. And whether there might be tools that could be used to identify that. In other words, let's say it's stress, and have you, know, have you looked into that kind of question? Um, we have in other work and not in this work. So, um, but we have a pretty good handle on the fact that <clears throat> basically education works along every pathway you can think of. So it can work on you know, the neuroendocrine pathway, it can work along behavioral pathways, it can work on physiologic dysregulation in general, um, you name it, it works on it in that way. So how you interrupt that, um, it appears to be interruptible in a, in a situation where, you know, you're changing the floor of the kinds of conditions that are causing those underlying processes. So places where people, where policies are strong, where states are investing in their populations, that floor, those less educated folks are doing pretty damn well, so to speak. So, and it's both behavioral and it's both exposure in a more classic sense. And I, I, 
I will say, generalized stress process, where stress is not well defined, unfortunately. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Great. That was great. Thank you.